again, welcome. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming to do this. You may not know this about me because it seems at odds with my chosen profession, but um, I am very much an introvert. I am not extroverted in any way, shape, or form. Um, when I took the Myers-Briggs personality test, I was so far on the introverted side uh, that it was, it was laughable. Um, so it does take a lot of energy and, uh, for me to be able to do this, and I don't usually talk about myself a lot. But I really feel that I should because I know all of you here in some form or another, and I really would like you all to get to know me a little bit better in the journey I've been on, because there's a whole lot before I ended up here. And I always think it's good to share, because the more we understand about each other, the better we can interact with one another, and the better we can be in community with one another. So I'm very honored today to be able to share my story uh, and how I arrived here to be with all of you. I owe everything about my spiritual development and my love of religion in general uh, to my mother and my grandmother. Uh, uh, both of them really made me the man that I am today in terms of my viewpoints about faith, my viewpoints about religion, and how it fits into daily life. My mother's family comes from Slovakia, and they were Roman Catholics. My father's family comes from Wales, my father said we were Church of England only because when he joined the Navy in the 1950s and he had to check off a box for what religion you were, he went and spoke to his aunt and she said, well, we come from Wales, so we must be Church of England. So he checked off Anglican. Um, and it's very interesting because on the two sides of my family, it was my mother's side of the family that was responsible in every way, shape, or form for my religious development. My father believed that only, well, not only, but too many scoundrels went to church. And so what was the point? Because if you could go to church and kneel down and pray to God and be good on Sunday and then go on Monday and, pardon my language, screw everybody over, what real good was... Uh, religion. So my father was not particularly involved in forming my religious identity, but my mother and my grandmother very, very much were. They were devout Roman Catholics, and I was a devout Roman Catholic for the first part of my life. Religion was just something that we did. It wasn't anything special. It was part of our daily lives. We followed the church teachings. If you were supposed to have fish on Friday, you had fish on Friday. If you had to go to church, you had to go to church. There was none of this, but I don't want to get up. It was get out of bed, the family's going to church. Right? And that's what we did. Right? Everything about the religious experience wasn't cordoned off for me. It was just a part of who we were. And because I was brought into that at an early age, they realized that I was extraordinarily fascinated and enthralled by the music and the rituals of religion, particularly my religion. Right. Religion was so important to my 
mother and my grandmother that when I went to school, there was no question. I went to a parochial school, the parish Roman Catholic school, right? And I went there from grades one through grade eight, and then I even went to a Roman Catholic high school. So I was indoctrinated. I was involved. Right? And I just loved religion. And I loved talking about it. I loved every day in school, just like over at the CJA, right? You have your religion class, right? You have your regular subjects, but then you have religion. And everyone else in the class, eh, you know, religion class, that's the time to goof off, but not for me. I very much enjoyed learning about my faith and learning about how I was supposed to live my faith. But I was always an odd duck. You know, I, I wasn't into sports, I was into music, I wasn't into the things that most people, most kids my age were into, so I was very much an outsider, and I very much felt like an outsider. But you weren't an outsider in the church. Right? So when the time came in fourth grade, who wants to be an altar boy? Oh, right? You mean I actually get to learn all of the rituals and everything in depth, and I get to understand how everything works, and I can actually be up there, right, in the front with the priest and everything else, right? And I get to be a part of all of this? Yeah, that for me was, wow, you couldn't get any better than that, right? The other kids, not so much, right? You became an altar boy because, you know, you're, normally their parents would say, well, your brother was an altar boy, you're going to be an altar boy, right? But for me, I wanted to be up there. And I very much wanted to learn about the ritual and how to do things, quote unquote, right. Um, and that's something that has stayed with me throughout my entire life, the desire to not just coast through the religious experience, especially when it comes to ritual, but to actually understand it deeply. I didn't know when I was being an altar boy that ultimately that would lead me to being a chazan. I didn't realize at that point that they shared a very, very common frontier. Um, but looking back, I can definitely see how the progression will go. And of course, just like with everything else I did, if I'm going to be the altar boy, well, I'm going to be the best altar boy. So I learned everything to an absolute T. You know, I knew when to kneel, when to ring the bell, when to do, right, when to be at this side of the altar, that side of the altar, when to get this, when to get that, right? One of the best things, because I was tall, they'd let me light the candles. That, to have the candle holder and be able to go out, light the, the candles and extinguish them. And because I was also very big and very tall, even as a kid, right, they would always let me carry the cross because I could hoist it up and I was strong and could hoist it up high above over everyone else, right? When it came time to learn the different details for the ritual, uh, especially rituals around funerals and things like that, when incense would be used, I learned that perfectly and how to make the charcoal go in such a way that when they put the incense in, it would billow a certain way and all of that. And I loved all of that. And the priests used to request me to come down whenever they needed altar servers for different events, right? Because what happens is if there was a funeral or something during the day, and God forgive me for saying this, but you kind of were happy if that happened because then the priests would call up to the school and say funeral mass at uh, 11 o'clock, we need three altar servers and you could get out of class, right? And well, you know, for, for a fourth and a four, fourth, fifth, fifth grader, right? That was a big deal, right? And uh, the priest used to always request, oh, and if he's available and there's not a test, send, send uh, Jane down, right? Because we like him, he knows what he's doing, okay? So religion for me and being involved very much in my church and in the rituals of my church was of great comfort because I felt like I belonged there. 
because I certainly didn't belong on the kickball field or on the baseball field or on the football field or anywhere else. I was a complete clumsy idiot on those right venues. But in my religious experience, I really felt that I belonged. And so even though I didn't have a lot of friends during my childhood, right, I had my faith and I had my involvement in the church. And that carried over into my home because my mother and my grandmother had religious rituals for every major event. You know, Christmas was a huge event because, you know, you had a special dinner on Christmas Eve that had special foods that my grandmother would only make once a year. And there were special prayers and a special ritual and everything that went around Christmas Eve, right? And that was so important. I loved every aspect of it, every, every ritual. The fa even the fact that, you know, during the meal, right, it was a bubba mice of some kind that you were forbidden to get up from the meal um, because you would say your prayers to begin the meal and do the opening rituals of the Christmas Eve meal. The foods would all be brought out, and until everyone was done eating and the final prayers were said, no one could get up and leave the table. And, it, of course, the Bubba Misa was that if you did get up during that time period, right, you wouldn't live to see the next Christmas Eve. And quite unfortunately, um, my grandmother, may she rest in peace, was completely obsessed with this because the year that my grandfather died, it was because he got up from the table. And, it, it, and that's what happened. That year, she had forgotten to bring something to the table for dinner. And he said, don't worry, Josie, my grandmother's name was Josephine, don't worry, Josie, I'll go get it. She said, George, sit down, don't you dare leave the table. He said, ugh, you and your superstitions, and got up from the table, and that February he died. So you, you, didn't, you didn't break the traditions in any way, shape, or form. But for every holiday, there was these traditions for Christmas, for Easter. So it wasn't that it was just a secular experience. It was the full deal, right? You were just involved, and there were rituals for everything, you know, that were passed down from, you know, my grandmother's family, going all the way through my great-great-grandparents in Slovakia, all the way down. So again, religion was just a part of who we were. It, it was just a natural part of our identity. And, and that made it sort of easy. Now, of course, you don't have a lot of in-depth religious thoughts when you're a young kid, right? I appreciated the tenets of my religion. I did what was expected of me because it was was expected of me. And because I loved the traditions and I loved everything about what my mother's family brought to those traditions, you know, I, uh, I didn't want to really in any way give them up. Um, the first real shock to my faith, or at least the first uh, sort of wave, came when my mother passed away when I was 16 because she was the center of everything. You know, the center of the faith, the center of the house, you know, with her and my grandmother. And of course, she died, she was a diabetic, and so uh, she had type 1 diabetes since she was eight years old. So the fact that she lived until she was 53 was quite remarkable. But uh, she died extraordinarily sudden uh, one evening in July. It was, it was it just, even to this day, I still can't believe because she laid down on the floor on some blankets like she always did on uh, Saturday night. And uh, a few hours later after that, I, I being a 16 year old was in my room trying to ignore my parents. And, uh, you know, and 
Uh, my father came running into the room at 11 uh, p.m. because my mother couldn't breathe. She was on the, the floor. She was having some type of an attack. We don't know what. They called the ambulance. The ambulance came. They took her away. My father left and said, I'll see you in a few hours. And he came back at 2 in the morning and told me she was dead. So that's a little bit of a shock. And that's quite... Uh, damaging to one's faith and one's worldview at that time. Especially because people say such stupid things when it comes to death. You know, uh, they try to be comforting, but, you know, they say things to you like, you know, oh, you know, you know well, God only gathers roses. Right? Yeah, okay. Fine. Or, you know, God doesn't give anyone more than they can handle. Oh, lovely. So you mean if I would have been a weak-willed person, my mother could still be alive? Thank you for telling me how this is all happening to me because I'm somehow strong in my faith and strong, you know, in my ability to have faith even at a young age. Right? It's one of the reasons why I don't say a lot when people talk to me about when they have people that have passed away because I heard too many things when my mother passed away that were just completely nonsensical and insensitive and contrary to any real mature faith. And it's better to listen than to say something that ultimately is only going to be hurtful, whether or not you think you're being hurtful or not. So when my mother passed away at 16, I became the keeper of our traditions. Right? Um, my father wasn't religious, but he very much enjoyed the traditions. So I wanted to keep them going for him, and I wanted to keep them going for myself. And of course, my grandmother, who had the ultimate pain of losing her daughter, she at least could teach the traditions to me. And even though I will never be the cook my grandmother was by any stretch of the imagination, um, you know, I became sort of the receptacle into which all the traditions of the family and all the traditions of the faith were passed down. And the death of my mother drove me even more into being active in my faith as a Roman Catholic because there was great comfort there, right? There was great comfort in becoming involved in being a lector and, you know, learning how to read from the scriptures or uh, being involved with, you know, learning how to uh, dress the altar and things like that for the different seasons of the, the church year. And by being involved in all of that and, you know, learning about all of that, it kind of took the sting out of losing my mother. It did a lot for me and my father, ironically, um, because, again, my father was, before my mother's death, was more on the sidelines for me. Um, he was obviously a very good father uh, to this day, and I love him immensely, but we didn't really develop our relationship until after my mother passed. One thing I did forget to say, when she died, that was Father's Day the next day. <laughs> so, the last thing my mother and I ever did was uh, I was uh, taking um, driving lessons at that time. I was just allowed to drive on the highway. And so the last thing my mother and I ever did together was to drive after the, uh, after the driving lessons to go out and pick up my father's Father's Day present. Right? That was the last thing that uh, the two and I ever did together. My father and I, because he wasn't religious, even though he loved the traditions and participated and never objected to me being taught religion, right? He figured, well, you know, he didn't care, so we had the religion of the family. Um, you know, he wasn't as involved because he wasn't as religious. So he and I didn't have the, uh, the, the deepest relationship prior to, uh, to my mother's death because he just wasn't sort of around in my faith world. Um, and I re remember very much, and again, I don't know if she knew anything or if there is such a thing as fate, but when we were driving to get my, uh, my father's Father's Day gift, my mother actually told me in the car, she was sitting in the passenger seat, she actually said to me, and I'll never forget these words, she said, you know, your father and you have to learn to get along better together because I'm not going to be around forever, you know. 
And I still can't believe how things like that uh, play out. Um, but with her passing and with me being the sort of keeper now of the traditions of the family and of the faith, um, you know, my father looked to me to keep that side of the family up, and he always very much uh, enjoyed it. You know, so for me, growing up as a child, religion, like I said, was just it was very practical. It was a part of who we are. It wasn't something that in any way was foreign. It just it was who I was, um, and it was a great comfort to me. So, as I got older. I then had to deal with other things, discovering other things about myself. Uh, so the next major step in my religious journey came um, when I was graduating uh, high school and going to college for the first time between 18 and 19. Because that was the time that I actually started to come to terms with the fact that I'm homosexual. Okay? Now I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Okay. And when you're raised as a Roman Catholic, especially a Roman Catholic in the 1980s, right, 1990s, right, gay is not part of the lexicon of a good Roman Catholic boy. Okay. Good Roman Catholic in general, but just a good Roman Catholic boy. It's not part of the lexicon at all. Um, and so... When I was graduating high school and getting ready to go uh, to university, I was dealing with that part of my life and how that fit in to my expression of faith. Um, it took me a while because so many of my friends that were struggling with their sexuality or other things, their way of dealing it with it was to just cut faith out entirely because the church is against us, you know, they tell us we're evil intrinsically anyway. We're all going to hell. We don't believe this. What do we care? Religion can just go. But I couldn't give up my faith. It was too ingrained in who I was. I wasn't going to give up my traditions, and I wasn't going to give up everything that my mother and my grandmother taught me and the foundation that they laid for me in my life. So I had to. I had to figure out a way to make my faith work with my orientation. And I wouldn't come out of the closet until that happened. Now, I had been torturing myself for years because, you know, you, you have these feelings, you know, right from when puberty starts, if not even before, because it's a part of just the natural development of who you are. But, you know, my faith kept telling me, ah, but this is God's test for you, and this is just, you have to get over this, and if you get through this and beyond this, a whole new world of beauty and glory will open up to you. Right? And I made myself miserable for years believing that aspect of my faith. Um, so when I was struggling with all this, I said that I can't come out and reject my faith. I have to integrate my faith into who I am. Because I can't even imagine the holes that would be in me if I had to rip out my ability to attend church, my ability to study, my ability to incorporate the dictates of my faith into my daily life, and also have to give up all of the rituals and traditions that came along with that. I couldn't separate that out of who I was because of how my mother and grandmother raised me. So... Um, it took me a while, it took me almost two years of struggling with it, but I finally came to uh, a, a, a level of peace about that. Um, what I finally had decided, based on everything I had been taught in school about God and about God's love for all of the world, and the fact that God is incapable of making mistakes and that all things in the earth uh, are part of God's divine plan and that nothing in the earth is outside of God. I finally said to myself one day, well, if all of that is true, which is what my religion taught me up to that point, if all of that is true, then there is nothing wrong with me. God loves me. 
God accepts me because God made me, just as God made everyone else. And God wouldn't make something that was a mistake, and God wouldn't make something that was bad or wrong or that had to be um, suppressed. And ultimately, I came to believe that, you know, because of what I was taught in my faith beforehand, that God wants people to be happy. And I was miserable suppressing that part of who I was. And if ultimately what God wants from the creation is joy and, and to serve God in joy, well then what good was I serving God in complete misery trying to overcome something that was an inherent part of me? That took a long time coming. That didn't just happen overnight. But that took a long time coming because I saw so many of my friends abandon faith altogether and become atheists and just say there can't be a God and all these things and, you know, separate themselves from their religious communities, their friends, their teachers, their families. And I just couldn't do that because, again, because of what my mother and grandmother did in terms of just implanting within me that religion and the rest of your life are not separate. You can't separate the service of God from anything else. Um, and so I, I was so happy when I came to that realization finally. Uh, and I, like a good Roman Catholic boy, when I was home on spring break, decided to go to my parish priest to talk to him about my great revelation that I had come to about how I could still remain a Roman Catholic, right, and be who I was and how that was not contradictory. Um, I don't blame the priest for what he said to me because we all have our own uh, issues that we're all dealing with, but I was so proud of myself. I was 19 years old. I went into the rectory. I sat down with the priest in the office. I went through my whole thing just as I went through with you, and he looked at me and he said, well, that's very nice, but you know, um, I have numerous, numerous feelings, but, you know, still manage to be celibate. And at that point, I knew that we were having two completely different conversations and that despite his best intentions, wanting to be the, you know, bearer of the faith to me, that we were not going to see eye to eye on this and it was not going to be helpful because he was not going to be able to support me and keep me in the community the way I needed to be in the community. Uh, and so at that point, I said, well, but then what do I do? Because again, if I can't stay in the Roman Catholic faith, this was the faith that my family raised me in. Again, I was put in that position of, do I have to now give up all of my traditions? What, where do I go from here? Aha, my father is Anglican. Right? Anglicans aren't too far from Roman Catholics, from what I understood. Right? And, uh, and I heard at that point that eh, Church of England was a little bit more tolerant, if you got the right parish, about uh, having homosexuals in the church. And they weren't as judgmental, and they had worked on their theology. So, uh, because I didn't want to stray too far afield, and because it would still be keeping things in the family, and because my relationship with my father had improved so much at that point because of the work that he and I had put into it after my mother's death, um, I said, sure, Anglican, why not, right? So uh, I very dutifully started attending the Anglican church in Philadelphia where I was going to university um, and started to learn about Anglicanism. And um, I did the exact same thing that I did when I was a Roman Catholic, right? I learned about it. You don't just go, right? But you study it, right? I bought a copy of the Book of Common Prayer and read it from cover to cover before I even set foot in, in the first church that I went to, right? Uh, I immediately joined the choir when I got there. Um, I immediately started to attend Bible study, right, with the priest. Um, 
and anything I could do to learn about the rituals of the Anglican Church and to be a part of it, right? Anglicans have adult altar servers, so I offered to do that. I joined the altar guild so I could learn more about the ritual of how, again, how you dress the different parts of the church and everything. And I studied the Anglican ritual. And through that, and through learning that, again, just like in my years being a Roman Catholic, drew a lot of comfort from it and drew closer to God as a result of it. Um, and I was so happy because I didn't have to give up everything from being a Roman Catholic, but I could finally find a place that integrated and accepted who I now was as I was changing. And uh, it was a, a marvelous and a wonderful experience, and I made so many friends uh, in the Anglican Church because I was interested in learning more. Right? So there was always someone who was willing to say, oh, well, you know, if you're interested in this, we have a group of friends who get together at a coffee shop. We, we you know, do Bible study. We read. We do this. Right? Or if I had questions about ritual, there were always very much um, people willing to engage me. So again, I found great comfort in my newly adopted faith. And then, because as I was coming out, I saw so many people of my friends fall away from any type of faith, I said to myself, ah, but you know what? The reason why they're falling away is because they don't really understand it. And I should help them understand it like my mother and my grandmother helped me, because if I could help people truly understand the rituals and things about their faith and help bring them in, and then they wouldn't want to leave it so quickly and cast it aside so quickly because I felt that that was my story. That's why I couldn't do it. So I always made it my business if I had friends that were saying, oh, you know, I used to be a whatever, but now I'm not because I'm gay or I'm this or I'm whatever, to go, well, but, you know, maybe we should talk a little bit. You know, what, what did you understand about being Roman Catholic when you were in the church? You know, were you an altar boy? Did you understand what this part of the ritual meant? Did you understand what this symbol meant? Do you understand what that symbol means? You know, and, and I would want to do this for my friends because I always believed that if they could have the same experience I had, maybe faith might mean something a little bit more to them, that it was ignorance that was causing them to leave faith and what that did for, right, for my life. So I, I wanted to give that to them. So that sort of became my little mission to educate people. So fast forward until... Uh, few years until I'm 25 and then uh, I, I met the man who's going to be my husband and he's given me permission to say everything that I'm going to say here so I've cleared everything with him. So I had never dated a Jewish person before. I don't know if I even really knew that many Jewish people before, right? I, uh, I knew my husband. So as we were dating and we were starting to form our relationship, I noticed that he wasn't really that involved in being Jewish. Um, and so I said, aha, okay. So just like all my other friends, you know, if I help him understand his religion better, then maybe I could get him to be more involved in his faith, I, of course, would then understand my faith even better because Christianity has its roots in Judaism, right? And then I wouldn't feel so much like it was just me doing all of the religious stuff. And I came to this conclusion because it seemed like the only involvement he had with his religion was arguing with his mother once a year about whether he had to take off work on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But that was it. 
I I didn't see anything else. So I said, no, no, it's because it's because he wasn't raised like I was raised. He doesn't really understand his religion. So it's a win-win situation. I can help him delve deeper into Judaism. I can learn more about the origins of my own faith. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. All right. So I started to say things like, Oh, well, but aren't Jewish people supposed, aren't they supposed to have a mezuzah on their door or something, right? And so it was through my, you know, urging that a mezuzah went up. Or we would go to my mother-in-law's for Passover every year. Oh, well, you know, what if we actually, like, looked at the Passover Seder beforehand and talked a little bit about it, and then we went and did it, right? Because, you know, maybe we could get, you get a little bit more out of Passover rather than just his mother rushing through the first half and putting out the apricot kugel and then saying, eh, Elijah doesn't need to come this year, and then going on and, and then ending the Seder. You know, maybe we could get more out of it. Or, because we, she only had one tape of a cantor, um, you know, singing, you know, trying to find where was the Manish and where was the Dayenu, and going back and forth, right? Maybe if you understood more about it, we could have a better experience together. And also, it was a it was a a, a very um, a self serving thing as well because of course my mother in law did not like the fact that I wasn't Jewish, because she kept th thinking I was trying to convert her son, because he had the audacity to go to church with me a few times because he was curious about wanting to see what was going on, and of course me wanting to teach and instruct and enlighten, said, come. You know, um, she did not like the fact that he did that. Um, to such an extent that in our house, before I converted, if ever there was a Christian symbol of some kind, there had to be a corresponding Jewish symbol so that there was equity, <laughs> okay? Because if there was only Christian stuff with no Jewish stuff, it was just proof that I was, you know, converting him. Um, and even though they are not a particularly religious family, the thought that he was going to be converted by me was just anathema. Um, it, this went so far down to the fact that in our windows, we had two sun catchers, one a cross and one a chai, that were in opposite windows on either side of our couch in the exact middle window frame so that they both hung exactly on the same level at the same place in the house, right? And this went on for a few years. And I was constantly, constantly, you know, again, because of my own curiosity and because I thought I was helping him, you know, I wanted to know more and more and more and more. So this all came to a head during Hanukkah, because we had gone into the city to see a play on one of the Broadway shows at the time, and it was very late. We were coming back to New Jersey. It was Hanukkah. We walked up to the apartment, now that had a very nice mezuzah on the door and everything, right? And we had our nice little menorah, right, on the baker's rack when you walked right in the door to our apartment. And it was about one in the morning, and we walked in. And he said, uh, you know, okay, well, it was a really great night. You know, we should get ready to go to bed. And I said, well, but aren't we going to light the menorah? And he looked at me, and he said, you light the menorah. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and I'll be darned if he didn't walk right down the hall and go to bed. And I'll be darned if I didn't get the candlesticks and the matches and light the menorah. And I did it, and then I had to ask myself why. Because he left. He said, you do it. I left. So that really started a very, very big crisis of faith for me. Because if I felt so moved to light the menorah without him being around, why? So that led me to do more reading, to do more Bible study. And I kept realizing, A, that I was getting far more out of this little educational process than he was. And that B, I was really starting to look at the scriptures when I did Bible study in a very different way. 
um, I wasn't buying the Christian interpretations anymore. I was looking at the scriptures more critically, and everything that I had been taught about the nature of God and what God wants of the world and how one is supposed to interact with God was becoming more and more cumbersome in the Christian system for me. Um, because I, all I really wanted to do was just talk to God. But there was so much more that was getting in the way of my ability to just talk to God one-on-one -on -one as an Anglican and as I thought back, you know, as a Roman Catholic beforehand. I was tired of talking to saints and feeling that God was inapproachable or that somehow God didn't care about me or my life. Um, and I really, like I said, I just wanted to be able to, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one without having to go th through intermediaries and hurdles and priests and, and everything else. And it was starting to get really extraordinarily cumbersome. And so I started to chisel away all the things about Christianity I didn't like. And when I was done, I, uh, I said, oh, well, to me, this looks like Judaism because of what I had been hopefully teaching him, <laughs> right? Um, but I wanted to confirm it with a rabbi first. So uh, because we belonged to a, a gay and lesbian Chavara group in, um, in New Jersey, uh, I was able to uh, get in touch with a rabbi who worked for the temple, reform temple that uh, was there, and I spoke to her, told her about all this, and I said, and so I, what I believe is that uh, I believe now that I've chiseled away all of the saints and all of the other intermediaries and all of the um, interpretations of, of scripture that talk about a, a messiah in terms that... Uh, that seem to have nothing to do with the actual scripture that they're actually based on. I seem to think that all of this is Judaism. And she said, um, yeah, that, you're, you're, you're pretty close. So I continued to think about this. Was I really delving that far away from my own basis of faith? I mean, the core hadn't changed. Because really, at its core, Christianity and Judaism share a lot in common with God being a God of love and being a, cre a, a creator God that cares for the creation, that is intimately involved in the creation. But a lot of the other aspects of the faith no longer rang true to me. Later, I found out what that was as I read more of Joseph Campbell. I needed a new mask, is what I needed because the, the, the Christian metaphors and the Christian mask of the divine that would allow you to interact with the divine wasn't resonating. So I needed to change masks. I didn't quite understand that at the time I was going through it, but that's really what it was, because I wasn't abandoning any core principles that I held, but it was the outer trappings of the faith that needed to change. But I was deathly afraid to tell him that I wanted to convert because my husband is not an overly, overtly religious person. And I was petrified that by telling him I wanted to convert, he would go, oh my God, he's going to, we're going to become orthodox, right? This, uh, no, it would be kosher, all that's Shabbos, no, I'm, uh, right? Because I, I, know, I know that that's not what he wanted at that time. Um, so I was very, very nervous to tell him. And so I was thinking about this and thinking about it, and it really tortured me. And I'm a night person to begin with, but I still stayed up a lot at night anyway. And, and one night, I came to the conclusion. I said, no, I can't deny it, right? Really, I've explored the periphery of Judaism. It's been extraordinarily meaningful to me. It's deepened my relationship with my husband. It's allowed me freedom to deepen my relationship with God, to talk with God more. It's, it, you know, it's just opened me up in ways that being a Christian never did. And so about 
I'd say three, four o'clock in the morning one night when I was lying on the couch, just, you know, torturing myself about this. I said, no, that's it. You're going to make the decision. You are going to convert. And then I heard. The cross fell out of the window. The chai never fell out of the window, ever, in the apartment. But at that moment that I decided to convert, the stained glass cross sun catcher fell out of the window and landed on the floor by the couch. And as far as I know, it's there to this day, because when we left the apartment, I was too scared to pick it up. I, I left it there on the floor. I didn't touch it ever since I had made that. And when we, when we moved out to move elsewhere, uh, I, I left it there. And I, I said, you know, <laughs> gig is into hate. I just left it there. And I, that's fine. So, but that, that happened. And then I began my studies uh, to, to convert. Um, and it was a marvelous experience for, for my husband and, and I, because um, he had to go to the classes as well, right? Because like any good, you know, rabbi or cantor, you know, that's running a conversion class, you know, you can't have one be more knowledgeable about the religion than the other, right? They, you both have to walk the path together. You both have to learn together because you're going to have to have a lot of conversations together about what your vi version and vision of your Jewish life together is going to be. And um, also, I had psyched myself out because I had read all these books about converting uh, couples who converted, and they all ended in the same way. One person of the couple became orthodox, the other person didn't. They fought, they fought, they got a divorce. And I was petrified that this was going to happen to us. So I was so happy that we went through the process together. And it was a marvelous learning experience, not only for me as I got to deepen my understanding of what my new faith was going to be. Um, but my husband actually got to, in his words, learn everything that he should have learned in Hebrew school but was never taught, right? Um, and, and so it became a, a really wonderful thing for us. Uh, and it made the wedding a lot more simple. And it made my mother-in-law very happy. Until I decided to become a cantor, now I'm too religious. But that's <laughs> beside the point. Um, so during the conversion process, right, during the conversion process, you had to start attending synagogue. So that's where I found uh, my community that was actually going to be my community that was going to support me for more than 10 years, all the way through me becoming a, a cantor. Um, you know, in New Jersey, I was converting with a rabbi in central New Jersey. I lived in northern New Jersey. Uh, she didn't know any of the synagogues or temples in that area. And uh, so, you know, she had the big book of, you know, these are all the congregations in New Jersey. So when it was time for me to go to synagogue, we opened up the book. We learned, oh, there's a synagogue that supposedly has shacharit services on Shabbat, uh, you know, in a few towns over from me. So we went. I discovered when I went there that it wasn't the main congregation that was having the services, but this little group of people. Um, because um, the main congregation only met when they had a bar or bat mitzvah on Shabbat morning, but this little group of about 15 congregants wanted to do something every week. And so this, uh, that's where I sort of ended up, going to this little group within a group that met every week in this, uh, this synagogue in Summit, New Jersey. And this is where I met someone who has been instrumental to my life as a Jew, uh, Rabbi Ruth Gase, who was uh, ordained in the Reform Movement uh, out of Hebrew Union College. Um, she ran this little minion group. And so, uh, again, just like with Anglicanism before it and Roman Catholicism before it, I just didn't attend services. I wanted to know. Okay, so why are we doing this? Why does this happen? And I began to question everything about the service. And so as we got closer to my conversion date, Rabbi Gase said, well, you know, after you've converted, you can start leading services, because they, they, I would sing and they would hear. So once I converted, um, that's exactly what they said to me. They said, well, now that you're full-fledged, right, you need to lead services. 
So I said, okay, well, how do you do that? Well, they tried to teach me a little bit. But again, my desire of wanting to know more and wanting to be more educated and wanting to know the minutia of what was going on, what did I do? I googled how to lead Jewish services. And what came up was the Cantor's Assembly, this movement's cantorial union. They have a bunch of uh, do-it-yourself musical sidurim. So I ordered all of them. And I started teaching myself, because I can read music, how to lead services. And as I got more and more confident, um, they would go and I would say, I'd like to lead this part of the service, and they would let me. And I bought the books on how to lane Torah and Haftarah, and I taught myself how to lane Torah and how to lane Haftarah. And so I said, I want to lane Torah. And so they gave me a little three verses, and I, I did it. And I have Haftarah, and I was completely self-taught, not really knowing what I was doing, but I kind of taught myself how to do everything because I wanted to be so involved in the group because it, I'm just not happy being on the sidelines looking in. If, I, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it all the way. And then, of course, Rabbi Gase, Ruth, being involved uh, with Hebrew Union College, they used to have a kolel there. And she used to run it before budget cuts um, make, made them nix it. So she would always tell me, uh, you know, Russ, uh, there's a class coming up at the Kolel you might want to take. There's a Hebrew class. There's a Judaic class. There's a class on Jewish history. Whenever they would come up, and then I would drive into the city to Hebrew Union College, and I would take the classes. Right? And so I took Hebrew classes there at the Kolel, and I took Jewish history classes, and I took classes on the different books of the Torah and everything, all because Rabbi Gase showed such an interest in me and said, you know, the kolel is free. Come. Right? They used to do a tikkun leil shavuot. And I would go at 6 in the evening till 4 in the morning. And I'd be one of the last ones standing at 4 in the morning and would do classes all night at the kolel at the Reform Seminary. Right? Again, and all because of Rabbi Gase. Because she said, you know, if you're going to do this, you have to do it right. And I know you're going to want to do it right. She was the one who, you know, has told me, um, and the, the first one ever to tell me, you know, when you lay in Torah and you, like, read Hebrew, you're going to have to be perfect. And I said, why? She said, because you have diction. You're a singer. You don't mumble. She said, people are actually going to be able to understand you, and that's going to be a curse because you're going to have to lay in Torah perfectly. All right? She said... Would be you were a mumbler. Mumblers can do whatever they want, right? Who knows? What did they say? Eh, who knows? There are already three verses in the past. But you don't mumble, right? So she set high standards for me, right? So she made sure that I was in classes with the proper teachers, right? And I did most of my learning in the early years of my conversion because of her through the Kolel. And I would not have the depth of knowledge I have. I would not have the fluency with Hebrew that I have, even though I, I can't speak it worth anything, modern Hebrew at least, um, you know, I wouldn't have anything that I have without Rabbi Gase taking such an active role in making sure that I did the Judaism right as a new, as a new convert. And so as I continued with the, this group, um, they broke away from the synagogue that was housing them. Um, and wanted to form their own little independent chavara. And so, because I had taught myself how to lead services, they said, well, if you can teach yourself how to lead services, you can teach yourself how to lead Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I did, from the same books that I used to learn Shabbat from the Cantor's Assembly. So finally, after a while, they said to me, and why aren't you a chazan? Why aren't you going to school to be a cantor? If you've taught yourself all of this, then... I mean, they just have to put the stamp on you, right? That's so, and then it's not that easy, but still. So finally, after a while, sure. Um, I thought I was going to be a chazan in the reform movement because at that time, the conservative movement uh, was not uh, allowing openly gay men and women to be in the seminary because it was prior to 2007. So it was, oh, well, you're gay, you'll go reform, right? That was just sort of what it was. Um, <laughs> The reform movement resoundly 
rejected me. Um, I was too pious. That was a, that. I was told that I was too pious. Um, uh, I, I was too new of a convert. How did I, how did they know that I wasn't going to become a Buddhist tomorrow? I was told that. Um, I was told that I did not understand fundamentally what it meant to be a member of the clergy. Um, and um, I couldn't play a Schubert waltz on the piano. And the piece that I used for my audition for the cantorial school was a beautiful, beautiful piece for announcing the new month by Israel Alter, one of the great chazanim. But it didn't have a piano accompaniment. And the piece had to have a piano accompaniment to be auditioned for the cantorial school. And so I was pretty much told, bye. And I wasn't going to go back into the closet to become a chazan because I had heard too many horror stories from people who had to do that to become rabbis and stuff at JTS. And then mercifully in 2007, uh, the seminary voted uh, and they passed the, uh, the, the responsa that said that openly gay men and women could be full members of the seminary. And the conservative movement, um, instead of telling me things like I was too pious and I didn't understand what it meant to be a clergy or anything like that, um, they said, you know what, we'll accept you where you are, and it's not going to be easy, but we have faith that you'll either sink or swim. And if you swim, then you'll be able to be a chazan in the movement. And, you know, it wasn't easy because that was a second career for me. I didn't go to college and all of that to be a musician. I went to college to be a pharmacist, right? I have a doctoral degree in pharmacy. Right, um, but so it was a second career. I was older, gay. I mean, I was the first gay student accepted. The, sorry, the second gay student accepted into the cantorial school. First one to graduate, but the the second one accepted. So it's not like there was a lot of us around. A lot of the professors were still very bitter. The more the more traditional ones about losing the vote. Um, and about openly gay students being a part of the seminary and being openly welcomed into conservative Judaism. So, and the seminary can be a lonely place at its best of times. But again, I was an outsider there, but just like when I was a kid, I took great comfort in delving deeply into the rituals of my faith and learning more about it, despite maybe not having that many friends at the seminary or being able to connect that deeply to you know, some of the younger students and things like that who were on very different paths. But what it did was it, again, it drove me very much into learning about the essence of what Judaism was. And uh, I uh, am here as a result of it. The interesting thing, given my current state of things, is that when I was in the seminary, um, one of the things you could apply for was a joint program to become both a rabbi and a chazan. And there were three people in our class that did that. Um, who You would spend an extra year at the, the seminary, and when you graduated, you would have both um, ordination as a rabbi and as a chazan. Uh, and I very, very much wanted to do that, very much. Um, not that I didn't think I was learning enough as a chazan, because you take most of the same classes that the rabbis take. Uh, you know, I took introduction to rabbinic midrash and introduction to Talmud and introduction to the Pentateuch and introdu you know, and you take all the same classes, most of the same classes introductory together. Um, but again, my desire for knowledge and my love for knowledge said, well, if I could do both, why not do both? Uh, but um, you know, sometimes there's just not enough money in the world to allow you to do both. Uh, I couldn't spend the extra time in the seminary, so I kind of said, well, okay, um, you know, obviously my love of ritual and my love of wanting people to understand the rituals and what's at the core of the rituals of our faith and how they relate, at least for me, to deepening my faith and to be able to teach that to kids, bar and bat mitzvah and the little kids at, at shul school, for me made it very obvious that the choice was chazan. But I never gave up the desire that really I would love to be able to deepen my knowledge even more and actually 
go the next level to get smicha ordination as a rabbi. But like I said, it just wasn't in the cards at the time, and you have to work. But since I never gave up that hope, I was constantly looking to see what avenues are open to people that have full-time jobs and that are serving communities and that either A, like me, don't want to give up the job because I want to continue to serve my community here, or B, you know, just can't because you need the money. There are surprisingly few around, um, and some of the ones that are, um, are <laughs> light, to say the least. Um, and so it's taken me a long time to get to a place where I was able to find a program that would allow me to continue to serve my community, but also give me what I felt was the level of study that I wanted to have. And so finally, earlier last year in 2019, that program actually, I finally found it. And it was very frustrating because, you know, so many of the the seminaries that are out there, like JTS and HUC, the Reform, the Conservative, AJR, the pluralistic one, they have all of these things, um, but you can't work a full-time job and do it. You just can't. Uh, and so I, um, I finally found, like I said, a, a, an online program that is going to work so that I can actually do some relatively in-depth studying as you know uh, as is possible and feel that I'm truly learning more about my religion and increasing the depth of my knowledge you know the core of my faith is based on the fact that you have to understand what you're doing and that's sort of the mission of my entire life to help people understand what they're doing because there's so much in faith that people just sort of, well, we do it because it's written, or we do it because it's what, you know, great-grandma did. But there's always reasons behind things that we do. And if we can actually truly find those reasons, then they open up such wonderful connections to keep us connected to the community, to keep us connected to our God. At least that's my philosophy of religion. Right? One of the reasons why, ever since I've become Jewish, morning minion has be so, become so important to me is because this is where people learn. Right? Because if you come on a daily basis or as frequently as you can, right, every day that you sit in synagogue doing something, you have another question about something or something new opens up to you. And so then you ask someone about it, and they answer your question. And that goes to another question, which has another answer. And before you know it, you actually have a pretty good understanding of why you're doing something. And then, then all of a sudden, when you have that, the words of the prayers can open up to you. And once the words of the prayers open up to you, then your heart will open up to what those words have to mean, what those words mean, and that will help strengthen your connection with God. And I've been doing that ever since I was a little boy, learning as to know this is when you kneel and this is when you bring this over for the priest and this is when you ring the bell and this is why you ring the bell and this is why today we light these candles but not those and this is why today we stand here in the church and not there and why the procession goes this way and why it then goes that way. And really I just applied that throughout my entire life as I was developing spiritually. But I owe it all to my mother and my grandmother because they said it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to say, why do we do something? It's okay to be inquisitive. And it's okay to like your religion. You're not weird just because you don't want to play sports, right? Because you want to learn something about your faith that doesn't make you different or weird. If anything, oh, we're so proud that you're doing that. As a result of the great debt I owe to my mother and my grandmother, that I honored them when I converted, 
by picking Hebrew names based on theirs. Um, my Hebrew name is Yochanan Yosef. So my middle name, Yosef, my grandmother, Josephine. So I picked Yosef for her. And my mother, that was a little bit more challenging because her name was Anna. And so um, we thought, well, okay, Hannah would be the Hebrew equivalent. So it has to be something with, uh, with a chet. But I didn't like the names with Chaim and all that. I, they weren't really resonating with me. So uh, the rabbi that was converting me said, well, you know, as long as the ch sound is the first major sound of the name, you know, so find something that has like a yud in front of it or a hey or something. And so uh, I, I came upon the name Yochanan. So Yochanan is for Hana, for Anna, for my mother, and Yosef is for Josephine, for my grandmother. Um, Neither of them knew that I would be Jewish. My mother died when I was 16, so I was still a good Roman Catholic boy at that time. And I couldn't, I couldn't hurt my grandmother to convert while she was still alive. Because having lost her daughter and believing that my father, who was an Anglican, that was a mixed marriage, you know, with her. And so I really couldn't really tell her or talk to her about my religious journey because I didn't want to hurt her or feel that have her feel that everything that she gave me as a foundation was somehow being rejected because it would be very hard for me to explain to her that no mom mom I'm just taking the foundation you gave me and using it to help me better understand this new experience I'm not rejecting the foundation in the past I'm using it as a way to delve deeper now that I'm an adult. Um, I just couldn't do that to her. So, you know, she never really knew about uh, my final spiritual journey. She was okay with me being Anglican because my father was Anglican, and after that many years, she had forgiven him for being Anglican. But I don't think going, uh, going into Judaism would have done that. But I do still hope that wherever they are in the Olam Haba, that they understand that they were the foundation of everything that I am and everything that I've become and that my faith is as deep as it is um, because of what they did for me. And because of my mother's death, I'm a good listener. <laughs> because I, as I said early on, when people come to me unburden themselves or to want to speak about something. I don't fancy myself that I know the answers, but you know what? I can really sit and listen, and I like sitting and listening to people and giving them a chance to be able to just talk and unburden themselves. I'll be the first to admit I have no qualifications as a counselor to tell you what to do, but I'll always be there to listen to you and make you feel that at least you're not alone. Because that has been a very important part for me. Because when my mother passed away, really I just wanted people to listen to me, not to spout platitudes at me. And I've kept that for the remainder of, of my life so far. Um, and it's really been a journey. Um, you know, Russ and I have sometimes, you know, weekly conversations about, uh, you know, things related to Judaism and whether or not we want to increase our level of observance here or is this really working for us, but it's the conversation that matters, right? Because religion isn't an on-off switch. It's not you do everything or you do nothing. It's we talk because we're in relationship. And that's why you talk to God, because you're in relationship with God. So just as you're, just as sometimes I talk to my husband and say, well, is this way we're doing Shabbat working, or is this, right? Sometimes I have to talk to God and say the same thing. You know, God, the, the way you want me to do X isn't particularly working. I'm really going to have to do Y for a while. And I've come to believe that God's cool with that, because really what God wants is the conversation, not the blind obedience and the blind observance. So, you know, Russ and I, we continue to talk a lot about what uh, Judaism means for us and about how that's going to be expressed in our own personal lives. And he still can't believe that his wasp goyish uh, boyfriend became his chazan, um, you know, uh, husband. 
Um, he still wants to know where the wasp Goyesha boyfriend went. Um, and, um, and honestly, he keeps telling me that, uh, you know, even though I have fulfilled a great dream of mine by being able to serve a community and to serve a community that I love so much and that has supported me so much, um, never in his wildest dreams did he ever believe that he would be the husband of the cantor. Right, that you know, and and what that means in a community such uh, such as this. Um, so now you know a little bit about me and a little bit about where I sort of stand in the community and a little bit about my philosophy and a, a little bit about how I sort of see Judaism as as a faith and as a way of life. Um, the core of my understanding of Judaism is the verse from Psalm 16. I will place God before me always. Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid. And I believe that's the core of Judaism. If every moment of every day, somehow God is not on your mind doing something, then you're not there yet. And I believe the way to do that is by asking questions and by learning and by delving seriously and deeply into the traditions and the rituals of our people. And if you have traditions that come down throughout the generations to you, cherish them. I don't do the Christmas and Easter traditions anymore. I miss them every year because I remember what it was like to do things with my grandmother and what it was like to have the family together. And even though we're making our own traditions in uh, Judaism, when I did finally go into Judaism, I had to give up all those traditions that came down through my family. And I know them, and I keep my grandmother's cookbooks and everything, and I cherish them. Um, so if you have traditions, and I say this to the kids a lot, too. I said it to the kids in the March of the Living class, right? You know, if you have traditions, don't turn your nose up at them. Understand them and try to figure out what they mean to you because not all of us have traditions that go back generation to generation to generation. I used to. I gave it up to follow my God in a way that made more sense to me, but there doesn't a day go by that I don't miss them. So, um, well, with that being said, uh, I guess I can open it up to questions if anyone ha wants to know anything a little bit more in depth or if I've touched on something that you'd like to know a, a little bit more about uh, just for, um, just for uh, it is 1.50, so I don't want to keep everyone too late, but uh, so, yes. Just, yes, please. Tada, very, very much for your heartwarming, candid, honest, just, just heartwarming story, your journey. It really touched my heart. Have you ever considered writing a book about your incredible journey? Huh. No, because I'm I'm not an author and I'm I'm such a, a bad speller and everything else. But I mean, my potentially maybe I could, but uh, at at the moment, uh, no, that hasn't uh, particularly uh, been something that I thought seriously about. But you never know. I'm just a baby. I'm only forty seven years old, so you know. If you could write a book, is that what she? Asked? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's if. Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'm, I'll repeat the questions. I am sorry. Yeah, she asked if I had ever thought of of writing a book, and like I said, no. But but I, uh, you know, God willing, I have a long, long time to go. So. It was a beautiful story. I was just going to ask if <clears throat> the Catholic Church would have been different to you when you um, <clears throat> um, opened up. Would you have stayed? So yes, okay, so the question is, is that if, if the Catholic Church had been different when I came out of the closet, would, would I have stayed Roman Catholic? Um, in the short term, yes, but I don't believe my journey ultimately would have been any different because, you know, I ultimately would have most likely met my husband, right? Um, I did a lot of paths along the, the way. I don't think the ultimate destination would have been any different. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was told once um, by a Chabad uh, rabbi um, back in Jersey that um, I must have been a misplaced Jewish soul that was working 
its way back into our people because there doesn't seem to be a rational explanation as to why someone can convert in 2002, join the, the conservative seminary in 2008, and be you know, a chazan and have the desire for knowledge and wanting to explore. I'm not a mystic by any stretch of the imagination, so I kind of, you know, I listen to it and it uh, that is in my brain a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't honestly believe my destination would have been any different. It's just I would have missed out on Anglicanism in the middle, I think. That would have been it, yes. Is your father still alive? Yes, my father is. He's 84 years old. He lives in New Jersey. You know, that was I, the one part I didn't touch on before was um, my nervousness about telling my father. Um, not because, well, because, I mean, he's, he's not religious, right? He, you know, he, he believes in God, but religion and everything is just a whole bunch of hooey, right? So, you know, but he does believe very strongly in God. Right, he always has that faith. Um, so I was nervous because, again, it meant no more Christmases, no more Easter's. I was moving even farther, you know, away. Um, and so I was very nervous about, you know, and especially because, you know, just a few years ago we had the whole coming out thing, and you know, my father being a man of the 1950s, you know, he's come a long way. You know, uh, I learned how to watch football. He learned how to go to musicals. It was, you know, we've we've come a long way together. Um, but I was still very nervous about telling him and opening up yet another potential, just not rift, but argument or you know disagreement. So I was very nervous about it, uh, and one day I did tell him, and he looked at me and he said the best thing to me that I just love. He said to me, so my, my childhood nickname is Rusty in the family, so my father calls me Rusty. That was the nickname my mother gave me. So he looked at me, we were driving in the car uh, someplace, and looked at me, and he said, you know, Rusty, he said, just never come home one day and tell me that you don't believe in anything. Okay? That... Honestly, and that's exactly what he said to me. He said, just please don't ever come home one day and tell me I don't believe in anything. Besides that, go for it, you know. And so, yeah, he's still alive, and we talk practically every Sunday on, on Skype. Not this month, though, because he's visiting my sister in uh, uh, Florida. He takes February off and goes to Florida. So, any other questions? Can I? Oh, oh sorry. Yes. So you finish them over there. Yes. I don't know if this is a question that really concerns you, but it does me, and I should have asked about it a long time ago. My mom and dad, I was brought up in a religious home, although I did write on Shabbos. Yeah. My mom and dad went to Sheol all the time, and they were davening. They were really there in their davening. Did they understand what they were reading, what they were saying? It was Hebrew. Do they understand no. it? No, most likely not. But I. Why are they yeah. so powerful so moved by davening when they don't know what they're davening so the the power in davening actually comes from multiple things first of all it comes from the fact that there's power in community right whether or not we understand all the words there's something very powerful being in a room with people directed in the same activity i hate to say it but it's the same thing as why singing in a choir is so powerful right because when we, when we as humans all join together in a combined activity and all put our attention and turn our hearts toward the same end, the connection between us is palpable at times. So even if you don't understand every word, just the fact that you're in the room with a bunch of people doing the same thing really strengthens the connections of the community and really is something very powerful. Also, again, the rituals of it, right? The movements, they become mantra-like. And it's wonderful because what that allows you to do is it allows you to free your mind, right? The reason why we have rituals that I've really come to understand, and again, I, uh, this came to me because of um, reading a lot of Joseph Campbell, he, when he talks about rituals from ancient peoples, right? What's the point of the ritual? The point of the ritual is to quote unquote wear you down so that you don't have to think about it anymore, so that it becomes just muscle memory to such an extent that then when you're no longer thinking about it, your mind can open up and have an epiphany. 
One of the things about saying the prayers, even if you don't understand them by rote, is that think of the Kaddish, how mantra-like it is. Right? And so you know the words, and you know them, you know the melody, and you're not even thinking about it anymore. You're doing it, and then all of a sudden, poof, something can come out of your brain that's really an epiphany. Right? So if I'm, and I've had that experience in the, the morning chapel, the, doing the Amidah, the silent Amidah, because I know the Amidah by heart. Right? So I don't even need the Siddur, I can just do it. And, I rem and, I'm, and I'm there, and I'm doing this, and I'm trying to recite the words, and there are times when my brain just wanders off because I've recited the words so many times that, and, and, and all of a sudden I'm reciting, but I'm not, and my brain all of a sudden can really hit on a point. So that's what makes ritual so powerful. That's why, even though we want to understand the words, I encourage people to do both. Until you understand them, learn the ritual and engage in the ritual, because you never know when your mind will finally be able to be freed and what you'll actually come to at that point. They enjoy what they're doing. Well, that's part of it, too. You do have to enjoy it. Yes. Um, you mentioned the sister. Yes. I was going to ask, in terms of um, relationships with other members of your family, okay, um, have they accepted you as Jewish? And have you incorporated them into any of your um, Jewish celebrations? Have you invited them to your home to share or into your Seder or, or anything like that? So when I was becoming Jewish, so I have a sister uh, from my father's first marriage. Pardon? Oh, sorry. The question was, do I, uh, the, the rest of my family, because I mentioned I had a sister. So uh, the rest of my family, do they accept me as Jewish? Um, so in, in, the, in my family, yes, we have my sister from my father's first marriage, she, um, she very much, again, accepts, you know, she's Anglican as well, right? But, you know, a Southern Anglican, but whatever. And, um, and um, you know, she's married and they live in Florida. So there's not a lot of chance for them to come up because they live quite far away. Um, and then the rest of my family is um, my father's sisters, my aunts and everything, and my cousins. Um, they all accept me as Jewish. That's never been an issue. Um, regrettably, ever since both of my grandmothers passed away, the family isn't as connected and as strong as it used to be. Um, they all came to my wedding, which was Jewish as all get out. Um, and they all had a lot of uh, a lot of fun because I think for most of them they had never seen a Jewish wedding before. And again, I uh, I made it my point to make sure that everyone sort of knew what was going on. You know, I handled the ritual of the wedding. Russ handled the reception. It was perfect because he could. He really didn't care about the ritual of the wedding, and I could care less about who sat next to whom. So, right. So it really was good. But so they, they've been involved in like major life cycle events for me. But mm, the family isn't as close anymore, and we don't really live close enough anymore now that I'm out here in Calgary. Um, but they've never uh, ostracized me or said, "Oh, you've given up," you know, the family faith or something, whatever. It, so. No, that's never been uh, an issue. Anyone else? Yes. Um, more of um, appreciation, I guess. Um, I think it, I'd love for the whole community to understand your story, but um, it now makes sense for when we sit over here in the mornings and you do teaching and, and why you are so knowledgeable about it because of your thirst for knowledge. But... Um, you know, so often um, we're always asking you questions, and you do have so much to share. And um, I don't know about others here, but I've always wondered how come you know my religion like a thousand times better than anybody that I know or many people I've known. Um, but now I understand your thirst and how you've studied and whatever. And I guess the appreciation comes from um, because I never used to go to Minion and I hated to go to Minion, I couldn't stand it. And now since my mother died, I'm here three days a week and in the mornings, and I'm like, how did I get here? But you make it interesting. Um, and I've learned so much because, of course, just what you said, I never thought of it. When you read the book, even I don't have a brain. And I, can, I don't know what I'm saying, and I've never known what I'm saying, and I'm 66 years old. But now I ask questions, and you answer the right. questions. And so exactly what you said, but I never thought of it. So I don't know if that's been anybody else's journey since you've been here, but I personally thank you for that. And also today to help me kind of put into words what's been going on. Well, thank you. And again, I, I owe that not just to my mother and grandmother, but as I said, you know, Rabbi Gase, without her 
mentorship when I was a new convert without her recognizing that I had this thirst of knowledge and needed an outlet for it by directing me into the kolel and without nurturing me, I may have ended up in a very different path. So part of it is my own thirst, but part of it was having a mentor that, that said, no, no, we, she saw there was something there and needed to foster it. And I, I owe so much to her uh, in addition to my own mother and grandmother. So, yes, sure. Cantor, I think on behalf of everybody, we really thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, and I, I say this uh, a lot, but I do mean it. You know, my door is always open. Honestly, come, sit, talk with me, ask questions. I'm, you know, ask me more questions about my own personal journey. Um, I'm not shy about opening up. Like I said, I'm an introvert, but that just means I need to kind of get myself in the, the right headspace to do it. But once I'm in the right headspace to do it, I have no problem talking about my story because I, I truly believe that there could be something that's inspirational in it to help other people. So please come and speak with me. Can I just ask you one more thing? Wait, one last thing. Yes. Um, I keep kosher. Yes. Uh, I had cousins in Winnipeg and they came to visit us and I was Shabbos and I'd made a Friday meal and all that. He took out his little tish dust and, and put a hard boiled egg on it and ate that. Right. Didn't eat my stuff. Right. Why? <laughs> Why? Because everyone has different interpretations. One thing that I've, I've learned very much over um, my journey in Judaism is that the reason why we as a people are so different, why we have, confer uh, why, why we have Orthodox and Reform, Conservative, Chabad, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, right, is because all of us have a way of understanding God's great truth, right? So when someone does that, like you had said, I don't see that as I'm right and you're wrong. No, that's, that's, that. that's, no, no, but, but I'm, I'm just saying, like, what I'm saying is that we all have a facet. We all have a facet of God's truth. He was hurt. Oh, and I understand that. And, and you were hurt by, by doing it. And, and what I can say is that it was wrong for them to hurt you in that regard. But I've learned that because Jewish people have very different understandings of how we interact and interpret God's law, sometimes we do things without thinking we don't mean to hurt people. You were hurt. And that is something that I well, also believe. A troubling. I know, and I can understand that. And, and honestly, because I believe so strongly in conversation, if you ever have a chance to say that, you should. Yeah. Not because you want to cause problems, but, but because the, the way we foster relationships is by talking and by expressing ourselves. Um, but hope, over time, even though I know it was troubling to you and, and hurtful to you, um, I hope that... I hope that you believe that it wasn't done on, under any malice, but just that it was handled in a potentially insensitive way, but not because they were in any way trying to say they're better than you or you're right and they're wrong, just because we all are in an ongoing conversation trying to discern what the great truth of God is. And sometimes we come to different conclusions about that, not because one is right and one is wrong, but because God's truth is vast. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.